everyone, welcome to another Café Rollist, a bit lighter than, uh, later than uh, than usual, although it's not the first one. Uh, yeah, today is my uh, treat yourself day because finally my son is back at the nursery, so I enjoyed myself. And what better way to end the day than with meeting three new uh, f members of the tabletop RPG community. Could you introduce yourselves to uh, the viewers tonight uh, or this afternoon if you're in the US? Uh, Anthony first? My name's uh, Tony Oliveira and I'm with uh, 23rd Century Productions. Hello, I'm David Saruka, also with 23rd Century Productions. And I'm Michelle Saruka with 23rd Century Productions. Great, pleased to meet you. You are a real gang. You've got the, the same cap, most of you, and the same t-shirts, all of you. What, what is that about? <laughs> Sarah, uh, our convention uniform. Since we won't be going to Gen Con this year, we figured we'd put them to good use for our, uh, our video interviews. Oh, well, th that's a good call. Have you planned to attend any uh, online conventions? Uh, We've got Virtually Expo in August, which, repla which is replacing UK Games Expo, so that might be an opportunity for you to engage with the European audience. Oh, yeah, that might be possible. Yeah, we're looking at Gen Con Online, so that one's definitely on the list, um, but we're just kind of playing it by ear, I think, just because it's different, so different this year. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. I had planned to go to Origins Online. Uh, but it's not happening. Gen Con, I'm supposed to visit the family after pff, six months in lockdown in another country. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff uh, I hope uh, I'll be able to attend. It's an opportunity. It's a, it's difficult times, but at the same time, it's a time of opportunity to be able to, to engage with conventions where we wouldn't. Uh, we've got a, a couple ice breaking questions since this show or this spin-off of the main show was started uh, due to the lockdown. Um, did each of you, wh what's your routine like at the moment? Is it uh, uh, impacted in any way by, by the news? Uh, Anthony? Uh, I'm fortunate in that I get to work from home most of the time. I still go into the office for my day job, um, mostly to keep morale up for <laughs> everybody else who also has to go into the office. But I'm one of the fortunate ones who... I, it has not uh, really affected my ability to work. It has affected the amount of my work I'm doing, uh, but I, I can't really complain. So is it the same for you, Michelle? Well, yeah, I, I run um, Southport Equestrian Center uh, out of the, the, the home, uh, the acreage. So we have horses that need taken care of, um, and we do, um, we've, we took a little break from teaching students for a, a few months, a couple of months, but um, now we're back to teaching students and, and most of the things. We're not going to do shows this year, but my workload, I think, has been more because uh, for a while we didn't have, we don't have as many volunteers coming out and things like that. So we, we've stayed very busy um, the whole time. So Dave, are you helping with the horses as well? A little bit here and there. Mostly, I'm there to help fix the things that get broken. Uh, like the, our uh, water decided that we needed a new pond and, and fountain, <laughs> so I had to uh, dig a hole and, and replace some hose that had gone bad. Um, so things like that that come up, um, and then a little bit with the horses, but uh, mostly keeping up with all the things that are uh, necessary to support a large property. Yeah, the, yeah. To the horses about the new schedule didn't work. The ho the horses didn't. Didn't follow the new schedule. No, no, they didn't. <laughs> uh, actually, on their the, on their downtime that they weren't busy in lessons, they decided property damage was their new hobby. Wow. <laughs> you know? yeah. But then I have my my day job is actually working uh, in IT, uh, so I'm I'm blessed I can work from home. I can work from anywhere in the world if I really wanted to. But um, so I've been working from home instead of going into the office, uh, and we'll be doing that for a while. So that's been a bit different. I'm used to being able to go around and say hi to people in the office and camp right now so I have to schedule the time to catch people. So is DIY uh, the new skill you picked or interest you picked the, the ring lately? <laughs> <laughs> yeah it came with the farm I didn't realize that at the time how much DIY was involved but it's a lot. Uh, horses they're uh. big when they lean on something they 
Fades to break. You, you, you learned how to uh, use bailing, time, uh, bailing twine and duct tape to fix a lot of different needs. I have it, a new appreciation for driver. It, it brings to <laughs> me the, the romantic uh, sight uh, in movies of an uh, no, TV show you see of a uh, uh, the the farmer, the people in the countryside fixing a what do you call that a, a, the post of the uh, the fencing uh, around their acres and uh, it's the sunset and this wedding with a big uh, John Henry yeah. hammer. Yep. What about yeah. you, Anthony? Did you pick any new skill or interest recently? Uh, no, my uh, mine's been pretty much unchanged. Uh, so I, I've been fortunate in that. Um, I just spend a lot more time uh, uh, on the computer. Well, I assume for for battle lords uh, of the 21st century. So let's not waste more time. And uh, what's going on with that game? What is it? Because I actually don't know anything about it. Because today it was my treat yourself day. But before that, I've been very busy with my son. I'm afraid, and I didn't even have the the opportunity to listen to the interview, which I'm sure is excellent uh, that you recorded with the RPG Academy. So. So, what is it, Battle Lords of the 21st Century? Uh, Battle Lords has been around, um, I mean, we're not surprised you haven't heard about it, but it's been around for 30 years, and for during that time, Whoa. it's flown under the radar. Um, not a lot of people have known about it. Um, I'll let Dave, Dave's better at explaining what Battle Lords is like than I am, so I'm going to let him take that one. Okay. Yeah, so Battle Lords is a sci-fi role-playing game system. It's on the crunchier side. Um, the setting is really what makes the uh, people so passionate about it. It's a dark, dystopian future. Companies are running everything. Everyone moves where the companies tell them to. And uh, the only path out, much like today where some people will choose sports to get out of the environment they're in and a path towards, you know, excelling. People choose mercenary life to fight against an incoming invasion and to work for a company to try to progress their, uh, their social status and uh, their fame and their fortune. Um, and it allows a lot of different ways of gameplay, uh, exploration, piracy, smuggling, uh, military, sci-fi, spying, corporate espionage, lots of different types of gameplay, all in this rich backdrop. So, and that started 30 years ago. Uh, did one of you started it or, or did it happen? Uh, it was originally written by a uh, U.S. military veteran named Larry Sims um, back in the late 1980s. Uh, he owned a, a game store in Buffalo, New York, and decided he wanted to write a role-playing game based on his experiences in the Army. Uh, and a lot of those themes uh, have carried into the game and are still present in the game. Uh, he's very much... Uh, the, the grunt in the trenches fighting with weapons and equipment built by the lowest bidder <laughs> is one <laughs> of the themes. And then we, um, we've we been playing the game for a long time um, and, and worked with... He then sold the game to some of his helpers that, that helped write, you know, help work on the game. And then we we had become friends with them and, and worked with them, went, you know, helped run their booth many different things and they kind of were ready to pass the torch and still do something with the game but they didn't you know they had family and other obligations and didn't have time so we uh picked it back up because it needed a, a it needed a fresh fresh face to it um you know we streamlined a bunch of stuff we made it full color it was all black and white before um so we really upgraded the book and and wanted to do this great system justice so it's the second edition then, or is it already the third or the fourth? Well, technically it's the seventh. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, show it. Uh, a bit to your, between you and, and Michelle, yeah, yeah, and the cover, it's nice it's and thick. thick. Yeah, nice. Nice logo, nice art. Yeah. Cool. Inside full color art. Cool, nice giant mech. So, yep. 
So what, what would you say is the f strength of Battle Lords of the 21st century? Is it the setting? Is it the system? What does the sit system focuses on? Because you mentioned the military, but is it more vehicles? Is it about the, the details of how you get wounded or or epic the fights are? Or, or on the contrary, very gr being very gritty and a sort of uh, uh, realistic? It's um, the the system is definitely gritty and realistic. Uh, it, again, it was based on Larry's experience in the military, and uh, if you anytime you look at the critical hit chart, you can see how gritty it gets. It's uh, it can get pretty graphic, um, but I think its strength is the way that system complements the setting. Of you have that sort of um, gritty military setting, but it also lends itself to uh, to other endeavors, you, know, you can be mercenaries, you can be pirates, you can be spies, um, and you can make that system as streamlined or as gritty and crunchy as you want. Uh, and a lot of people really enjoy uh, that aspect of being able to uh, to tweak it and play with the level of crunchiness to get uh, uh, to get get it just how they want it. I think it appeals to people who enjoy role playing, but it also appeals to people who enjoy war games. So we have a lot of very interesting characters as well. Um, we have lots of alien species, and the dynamics between them are built in. Um, you know, one of the things if you're building in the military, you have a bunch of people in your unit that may or may not like each other, but you all have to learn to work together to do your job. And that was built into this system that we have many different species. Um, they don't necessarily like each other. Like we have giant bunny rabbits, and then we have giant cats. You know, and they obviously don't get along very well, but if, you know, the cat kills the bunny, then, well, the, the mission will probably not do well. Um, you know, so we just have a wide variety of um, species you can play that, that appeal to many different people. So what's the base of the system? Uh, I don't know, is it percentile? Is it, does it use uh, successes, D6, D20s? Uh, tell us a bit about that. Uh. Yeah, so this is David. Um, so the system's a percentile-based system, and it's because it's a uh, as you go as a character, it's very open-ended, which can be a, a bit of a struggle because you have the ability, much like life, right? Um, we start off in one set of thoughts about where we're going to be in a few years. Over time, we pick up new and different skills, and all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a different place. And this models that very well. So somebody can start off with one concept for the character, and over the course of adventures modify that concept to something significantly different and uh, so you basically are looking at percentile based things off of skills people pick the skills they want and then they grow those skills or grow new skills and uh, how did you each of you were introduced uh, to the game uh, did you happen to be on the same group or how long ago was that uh, Anthony I was introduced to the game when I met uh, Larry, the original author, at Gen Con in 1990. Um, and in addition to his creativity, Larry was a consummate salesman. And I'm pretty sure he could sell air conditioners to people uh, living in the Arctic. And it didn't take much for him to pitch me on this amazing science fiction game uh, with uh, alien samurai and armored cats. And uh, I, uh, I brought it back. I brought it and brought it back with me, and uh, I introduced everybody I knew to it. And we started playing it. So Larry was lucky to find uh, another salesperson to uh, to create a fr local franchise. Then we're trying. We're trying. We're trying. And then uh, Tony brought it back. Um, we were in the same. We played role playing games. You know couple of times a week we got together so he brought it back and said, hey guys you need to try out this system so that's and then we loved it do you remember what was your your first character michelle when anthony brought the game oh i i'm sure i played a scissor act um so they're, <laughs> they're giant armored battle cats and they have agility so they spring through the air they can like jump over their opponent and then they have these these cannons you know basically big machine guns or whatever, pulse rifles mounted on their back with a look and shoot harness. So they can be flying through the air and look at you and shoot it. So, um, and all of them are female. They're, they're all female. Uh, the, the 
the scissor rack keep their nails at home in chains where they belong. So, wow. <laughs> so they're, they're the female warrior race, they're, they're, they're very agile. They have claws, you know, so it's, it's just a giant battle cat. And, and they, they were very fun to play. And you could have a lot of fun, you know, role playing because they, they in general, you know, think, look down at men. And it, it was just, it was hysterical to play too. So Dave, were you kept in chain uh, at home? Uh? <laughs> I refuse to answer that question as it may incriminate me. <laughs> no, um, so my uh, first character was almost certainly a Mutsakan. Mutsakans are, uh, they look kind of like the stereotypical aliens you could imagine from like uh, Roswell. Like the New Mexico, Roswell, New Mexico aliens, that grayish kind of uh, oval head. Um, and um, for those who aren't familiar with the game, they are basically psychically able to manipulate energy so they can hold a glowing ball of energy and throw it at you. Um, they can suck all the power out of the spaceship if they're powerful enough. They can manipulate time and space um, when they get powerful enough. Um, but mostly, I, I, I well, a lot of the beginning stuff that I did was because I was so small, buying really good armor was easy, so I would walk around, pull people out of danger because I couldn't be hit. <laughs> And what did you add in store as the game master then, Anthony? Uh, what did you put this uh, little gray man and battle cat uh, into? Uh? The uh, uh, in in the early editions of the game, the hardest the, the thing I had in store was most was trying not to kill them <laughs> immediately. Um, <laughs> the game can be really lethal. And uh, that's one of the things we fix in the newest edition is we give a lot more guidance on that. But um, the very first time um, I played the game, I killed one of the player characters in the first minute of the game. <laughs> and I, so I was trying not to do that with them. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, they uh, uh, the first mission they played was probably uh, Space Resort, where they were pest exterminators on a luxury space resort. Uh, and it turned out the, the the pests that they were there to exterminate were three meters tall and and weighed you know thousand kilos and and, and ate people, which made the made it exper uh, experience interesting. It's uh it rings a bit like a, a British classic uh, over here. Have you ever checked uh, Red Dwarf? Yes. Because you, you st uh, he starts as a, the lowest ranking uh, individual on the ship uh, who's, uh, who needs to clean up things and, uh, and kill the pest uh, as well. Uh, are there movies, comics you find are especially appropriate to, to compare to the universe to sort to illustrate it? Like, I don't know, it's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles but uh, in spaceships or it's Cosmocats or is it more... Uh, more some hard science. Is it more uh, Robert Heinlein or, or things like that? Uh, do you have references you recommend when you you try to explain the game to, to people? I know Dave's got a list. Got yeah, a pretty long list. So the, because of the flexibility of the game, we've really expanded the the places people can go with it. But the the traditional kind of a thing I would say would be like Fifth Element. You've got a very dystopian world. Somebody says we need to. We're seeing a downturn, fire 10,000 is what we need to do, fire half a million. I only need a half a million. Yes, sir. You know, so there's that dystopian feeling. It gives that feel, or Blade Runner also gives that dystopian feel. Um, Fifth Element has the action, because this is, tends to be more of an action run and gun kind of a thing, typically in the traditional mercenary or soldier world. Um, if you go more less mercenary, more soldier, then you might think Starship Troopers, right? With the invading alien bugs and, and taking them on. Um, but if you want to go exploration, you could do um, Valerian uh, and the plan uh, was it a thousand planets? Um, yep. A planet of a thousand something. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, <laughs> I know the the French title, which is Valerian and Laureline. Uh, but uh, yeah, the the latest uh, another Luc Besson uh, this time inspired by by comics. Yes, that one is what I was thinking of. Um, so that's another place that can be gone with more of an exploration feel with some, some mercenaries. You could also basically take James Bond, push it forward into more of a um, sci-fi look and kind of get that corporate spy kind of a feel with a little bit of action. Um, or you could go more like Firefly and Serenity where you're out there just trying to survive free and independent of all of the 
uh, influence of the companies. Um, another one that's again gets that dark feel of kind of this controlling aspect would be Judge Dredd. So, so Judge Dredd in space. Know, Wait, yeah. it's very cool and evocative. There's something bright in colors. Uh, I find uh, only recently a bit with Gu Guardians of the Galaxy. Now we we sort of have that having science fiction, which is something else than. Uh, polished metals or browns or gray, but high colors, uh, high action, high uh, on fantasy as well. Uh, so, what's actually the the news with Battle Lords uh, of 21st Century? Did you just complete it a Kickstarter? Are you starting one, or are you releasing the the new edition and it's available for people to purchase already? The, uh, uh, the oh, go ahead, Michelle. Uh, it, was, uh, it is available, um, available to purchase. We just ran the Kickstarter for our first supplement, Charlie Foxtrot, which is a, a lot of different um, scenarios in the more armors and weapons and some short pieces of fiction. Um, so that just completed, and, and we're finishing up that one. But the main book is, is ready. Um, uh, uh, okay. we'll look for, so our aliens, you know, you said you like vibrant colors. Nice. So like, well, this is your, one of them. You know, because aliens are, are not necessarily brown. I mean, why would they have to be brown? Why not, you know? Lots yeah, it's, it's like dinosaurs. We, you know, in the 90s, we pictured them as brown, and now they, we realized they were covered with feathers. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Um. You know, it reminds me, I my first role-playing game was Star Wars D6, and one of the things I find very cool with Star Wars D6 is that you got all those supplements you got a, a true legacy of publishing behind them. So across those 7th edition and 30 years of history, do you have a, a very large number of supplements which you are looking to maybe bring to this very last edition? Uh, what, what does the catalog of Battle Lords look like? There are about a dozen PDFs for the, the prior edition, 6th um, edition, that are available. Um, most of the books, uh, the print runs have been sold out. There are a few exceptions. Um, but uh, yeah, there is an extensive catalog of books that flesh out the universe, and we're in the process of, uh, of bringing those into the seventh edition and updating them with the new rules and, and tweaking them a little here and there. Uh, but we do have uh, a devoted fan following, and they're all intimately familiar with the, with the, the, the history of, of the game and then the different supplements. So your latest supplement is a series of adventures. Uh, are they connected? Can you what can you tell us about this supplement? So the uh, so the supplement is aimed at uh, a number of one-shot type adventures to cover a range of gameplay types and um, character. We don't really have levels in the in the game system, but the, for lack of a better term, different levels of, of, of gameplay. Um, so we have an adventure that's uh, very entry level, they don't have much equipment or skills, and they have to survive in more of a soldier context, we have mercenary context, pirates, uh, we have um, a little bit of almost an explorational feel on one of them, we have, uh, you know, just lots of different ways of thinking about things, a corporate, a corporate spy kind of a scenario, so just kind of help people think about different contexts to give people a way to kind of latch onto the game mechanics and to get them familiar with a genre of play and then as they look at these different genres and they can kind of go okay well I, I am inspired by this this is where I want my gameplay to be and my players enjoy this as well so we'll we'll pick this one um, because it has a lot of opportunities in it that don't necessarily come out it, it's so open-ended it, it can be hard to get a hold of and, and, and figure out what to do with it yeah, it can be vast and sandboxy, so how do you find your center in that before you, you move forward? Uh, Michel, do you have a favorite uh, adventures in that supplement? Um, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I hope I, so. I like the spy one. Um, th there, there's a spy adventure that is just tons of fun. You're, you're sent in to uh, uh, acquire the asset um, and, and and much mayhem is had, um, and the, there's a Mazian in there, and a Mazian's basically it's a blob, you know, it's it, it's a blob. Um, so, they but look like anything. but they can look like anything, 
So if it touches Here's you, a picture of a guy, the blue guy there in the suit in the middle, you can see the tendrils. He's trying to blend in, but then he wants to get some things. So he's just sending off little tendrils wherever he wants. So, so. they can they can replicate, you know, like if they touch someone for long enough, they can turn into an exact duplicate of them, like down to the DNA, you know, the DNA, they can replicate, you know, uh, eye patterns, fingerprints, anything. So they're, they're a great spy and, and you can just do so much with that character. Um, you know, it, and this one has computer hacking skills. So I, I think at one point they, they had him coming in as a briefcase and then um, they needed to be a secu you know, security guard stopped and they're like, okay, we need to get out of this. And they're like, hey, you know, look, look, look here in my suitcase. And they open it up and of course the guy just gets to blob out and go over his face and, you know, then choke him out and then become that person. You know, so it's just, it, it's such a fun scenario of you can be very creative with it. That it's sounds very fun. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I think it's fair to say that we haven't had any two teams do it the same way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, things can be quite surprising when you hand once you hand a, an adventure to a group of, of adventurers. Uh, did was it written by one of you three, or did you commission uh, writers from the community? We uh, write them, and then we, they get passed around to everybody in the company, and then we, we tweak them, and we play test them, and we run them at conventions, and then we tweak them some more. But um, every one of those scenarios, everybody here has sort of had their hands in it, um, writing and rewriting it. Cool. So, uh, Anthony, what's your favorite adventure in that supplement? Is it the same one? I hope not, because then we already discussed yeah. it. <laughs> um, I like um, the one I was talking about before, uh, Last Resort, um, where you're the uh, you're the pest uh, team on the space resort. Uh, because I think it's a great introductory adventure for anyone who's just starting Battle Wars. It really um, it, it, it catches a lot of the, uh, the the themes of the game, the dark humor, um, and being totally out of your element in, in terms of you're not prepared or equipped to handle the threat they throw at you, but you have to do the job anyway with your wits and what equipment you have. Uh, and um, I think it, it definitely represents a lot of the themes that we have in the game. Uh, and uh, that, that's why, that's the, usually the adventure I run for anybody if they've never played the game before, I run that one first. And is it featured in that supplement that you just kickstarted? It does. Oh, cool! Wow, your first adventure is is in that supplement we just were released like twenty, thirty years of history uh, all packed together. Yeah. So, Dave, guess what? Guess what is my question to you? I hope you you had some thinking about it. <laughs> so, your favorite adventure in that new supplement? Which one is it? Oh, no. I wasn't ready for a quiz. Uh, <laughs> um. So I think it probably fair to mention the other one that we get a lot of really good reviews from at the uh, at the conventions. We mentioned we test all of these at the conventions as well. Um, is one that's a jailbreak, a little bit different kind of a jailbreak. The team is uh, supposed to acquire. They've been they've been contacted as mercenaries by the head of a crime syndicate whose leader has been caught and is being put into a supermax prison. And there's a four minute window that they have to get this guy off of a planet that's covered with an acid atmosphere and they've got to get in, not get dissolved, find him, get past all the security guards and security and get out and they've got four minutes. <laughs> wow, that's all, I love the idea of a acid atmosphere. I mean, as a, as a mean of protection, I can imagine there's a a metal tube station, something using a, used as a gate to go through. Uh, I, I've, yeah, it's very evocative and 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 quite cool. So, how do you how do you manage that running games at conventions? Because I'm developing my own game and uh, I've not run it in conventions yet. But uh, uh, do you have a group of game masters that you brief? Do you do you reuse the same adventures? Or how do you manage that? Do you have advice for, for a young designer like me? I, I would... Um, we have the same group of people that run them every year, and they're people that we've played the game with for decades, um, and they, they know the system pretty well. But at the conventions, we always... Um, 
focus on uh, keeping the, the rules simple, we use a streamlined version of the rules, the same version that are in the quick start rules, which you can get for free. And, uh, you know, I tell everybody that there's the three things to remember. The goal is for the people playing to have fun. Otherwise, they're not going to like your game. <laughs> uh, and the second thing to remember is whatever you have planned, it's going to go off the rails. Uh, because like you said, adventures will do weird things. Uh, and you have to be able to think on your feet a little uh, in, in terms of, uh, of handling those unexpected events. Uh, th those, are, those are the two things I tell everybody. Dave, Michelle, you guys have? I was going to say, I was going to give you an example that, that leverages those two points. So one of the games, uh, one of the scenarios we ran last year is a, um, it's called Hold the Line. It's a last stand scenario. The team is tasked with evacuating a hospital full of patients from a city that's being overrun. Imagine Starship Troopers, all those bugs coming in, right? And they've only got a narrow window to get as many people out as they can. Uh, and they're not going to get everyone because there's just not enough time. And so they're, they're fighting to try to keep as many people alive as possible. And in this adventure, one of the guys that had been playing just gets taken out by the, the boss battle, right? Boss battle, he just, boom, he's gone. And he, there was a different character he played in a different game, and he's like, wait, this is a hospital, right? He's like, yeah. He said, there's an Aerodani. He's on a cart. He stands up. He pulls out his sword. He comes running up to my, like, we're going with that. <laughs> so he just brought in a new character out of the blue. It just, it just worked. And everybody had a hysterical time with that. <laughs> Great, Michel. Do you have uh, any uh, experience with uh, uh, what would be the the most out of the rail uh, experience of an adventure you remember? So, I, I, yeah, I had a guy playing that that scenario that they were rescuing, and and they come up and they get drug in to the boss at the end, and it's the a big boss Ir Iridani. Actually, I should pull up the picture. Oh. Because we just got new art for her. Oh yeah. Um, I think okay. I got her pulled up on my phone. Well, they they. You you talk. I'll okay. Back yeah. Look. So they just um. So the guy comes in, and he he does something, and so he's he's basically the the shapeshifter, and he comes in, and he just he goes in, and he just says, okay, I'm going to tackle this per, this big boss out the window There's of the of the thing. So. You know, oh, you nice. Know, I'm just going to take her, tackle her out the window. You know, I, I'm going to die, but whatever. You know, so tackles her out, rolls well, tackles him out the window. I'm like, okay. Uh, you know, so, so it worked. And then they're flying out the window. And since he's a shapeshifter, he's like, I'm going to form into some wings or a parachute and go cut it to the side. And, um, and it turned out that didn't work. So he winds up. As this Iridani is flying out the window confused, it, he doesn't really see this person because it kind of goes to the side, but he grips back on and becomes basically a second skin around the back of this Iridani who's unconscious going out. So basically like a coat. It's like, okay, you did that. It's in shock. So the, the jump jets go on for this Iridani because taking out the window wasn't good enough. So her jump jets go on to go back in while well, he's behind. And he, and he said, is there anything on, his, uh, on the Sierra Donnie's back? It's like, yeah, she's got this big pulse gun. So the, so the Sierra Donnie's mad, comes in, lands in, starts stomping off. He's like, I'm going to just ooze over and take the gun and just shift it up and point it in the back of her neck and makes the roll. So he just takes the gun that's on the the the, the Iridani's back, puts it up to the neck, and just <laughs> pulls it. It's like, there you go. That was the most creative end, just from the whole thing, you know, that that I've ever seen. And you know, he rolled it. it who would have thought you'd have a blob on your back that's slowly moving your gun? Especially, I mean, it's wiggling around anyway, so it it made a lot of sense, and it was it was it was a good. If you have a creative player running a, a basically a formless shapeshifter, you can you really have to think on your toes sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, you might have regrets allowing that, uh, or you, you need to be uh, you, you need to be straight in your boots. You, you sound like a, you got a very well oiled uh, convention operation, and um, recently, uh, what well, I've noticed, including myself, a lot of people moving from 
playing in person to playing online, uh, and ag again, it, it's an opportunity. Uh, will uh, Gen Con your, be your your first sort of uh, major operation running the game uh, online? Uh, are, are you offering sessions to people who would like to try the game uh, online? Or, and if so, through what means can they get in touch with you? Dave, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so we've, we've tried a few things before all of this broke, just as we were trying to do play testing for things. Uh, but uh, for Gen Con specifically, we're going to have registered events. And uh, so through those events, we'll, we'll want people's contact information just because, uh, as technologies want to do, sometimes things just go off the rails and we need to be able to reestablish contact. Uh, so there'll probably be email involved just because we need some way of getting a hold of people. Um, and then we're looking at leveraging Zoom and Roll20, Zoom predominantly for the face-to-face -face interaction to try to get as close to being around the table as possible. And then where appropriate for certain scenes, it's easier to have reference material and have a map and, and people to move around on the map. So we're looking at uh, Roll20 to help with that aspect. Um, and we've got some backup plans if that doesn't uh, test out well, but uh, that, that's, the, that's the general thought process we have. So you created a, a whole bunch of assets for to run uh, the game on Roll20. Uh, are, are these available to players? Or will they be at some point? Um, we don't have that built out for Roll20 for general consumption. Um, but uh, when players buy the supplement, obviously they can, they can take the time to upload uh, materials. I don't know yet if we will um, make that a little easier from a PDF perspective or, or not to, to be able to roll on Roll20. That's a, that's a good question. We haven't kind of gotten there yet. First, first person who's asked that. Yeah. yeah, first question. Thank you. Great. Uh, I strive to ask good questions. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the future like for uh, Battle Lords uh, of the 21st century? You just released that supplement with uh, one shot. Uh, are there campaigns, are there supplements centered on specific sectors or types of campaign? Uh, yeah, wh what is the future of publishing uh, for the line like? The, uh, the next book that we're working on, we've got a couple in the pipeline. Um, and uh, the next one is primarily going to be expanding uh, armor and weapons and equipment. Uh, and then the, uh, the book after that are going to be, uh, we call them hostile alien life forms or HALs. Uh, there is a, uh, a criminal organization in the Battle Wars universe called ARM, and it's headed by this nihilist named Uncle Ernie Philberg, who is a, uh, a genius. He's a mad genius, but he's a genius. And he makes all these hostile life forms and he sells them to the highest bidder who can use them for whatever they want. Or if he gets bored and he wants to test them, sometimes he just dumps them on your planet to see how they work. Um, but that book will be filled with those hostile alien life forms. Now, one of the things that we wanted to do that was a little different than how it's been done in the past is rather than just have a book that's this is all your weapons or this is all your, all your hostile aliens, each book is going to expand a little bit on the Battle Wars universe as a continuing timeline. So each one is a year in the future, essentially, and you're getting uh, more current events. You, you can see how the Battle Wars universe is changing and evolving, and you'll learn a little bit more about it from the fiction in the book uh, in addition to the, to the main content that's in there. So does that mean, because I've seen that with some uh, set universe that what you would see happening in the official books was sometimes a campaign played by the developers of the book are major events things which happen in your home campaign or in session you played uh, here and there these are, are pretty much brainstormed out by us we we uh, they weren't part of a campaign but when we developed the core rules we sort of sat down and and said you know where where do we where do we think these races, these species have been, and where do we think they're going, and how do we think that's going to develop? And that was one of the things we hashed out in the very beginning. So we, we sort of have a plan, part of a plan. It's at least 11% of a plan. That's right. Well, no, sometimes you, you should not give, uh, especially for a line like that, too much agency. Uh, to, to players are uh, some of my favorite games, like Legend of the Five Rings. At some point, it went a bit weird because apparently what they were doing was the winners of the trading card game would decide on major events 
in the setting and it would impact even the role playing game. So a few weird things happened <laughs> at some point. <laughs> so having strong curators look at for after things uh, is a is a good thing, I think. Uh, great. Uh, well. I will advise you again uh, to try to to engage a bit with the the European community through uh, Virtually Expo, which is the uh, replacement for UK Games Expo this year. Uh, UK Games Expo is pretty much the size of Origins, so it's quite big. It's not as big as Spiel, but it's m slightly more about tabletop role-playing games and certainly more about uh, uh, the English-speaking uh, audience. And uh, it's. Uh, there are very fine folks uh, organi organizing that, so I, I do recommend the, the. I'll send you a link there because signups for tables are already not not for players but for game masters. You can already submit your your events. Oh. So, so okay. yeah, is there anything else you you wish to talk about uh, before uh, w we move on uh, back to our lives? <laughs> I, I would say that uh, in in terms of the uh, the European audience, uh, yeah, again, it is definitely a market we're trying to break into. The the product is available in uh, in Europe through uh, TradeQuest. Uh, has a huge warehouse full of Battle Lords books ready to go, uh, and then uh, Games Quest. I'm sorry, Games Quest. And then for uh, brick and mortar stores, uh, they can get copies through TradeQuest, which is a sister company of Games Quest. Uh, so the uh, the book is available in Europe, and you don't have to pay to have it shipped from the United States. There's already a uh, a stockpile there. So uh, it was actually printed in Europe, and we just said, you know, leave leave some of them there. Now <laughs> we don't have to ship them back. That's a good plan. Logistics can be uh, very difficult. Well, if you're after uh, breaking into France, I recommend you check the my last episode of my podcast because it's dedicated to a tabletop RPG and game shop based in France so you can find their contact details and more information about them uh, within the episode so that's that's my own shameless plug <laughs> great uh, what was I about to say well uh, I guess it's goodbye then it, it was very nice uh, uh, interacting with you I hope I will have an opportunity to play the game online uh, sometime uh, virtually expo or elsewhere we'll see uh, yeah, one final word to each of you and uh, goodbye and where can people find you, uh, each of you, if you wish to be found, which I assume you, you wish to be found. Uh, the, uh, the companies on most social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Discord, we do have our own Discord. Um, you can email us for an invitation uh, and the email is info at 23rdcentury.net uh, and 23 uh, rd century. The, uh, I guess the last thing I'd have to say is if you're curious about the game, you can download a copy of the Quick Start Rules and you can offer it for free uh, off of a number of sites, uh, Drive Through RPG, Indie Press Revolution, Studio 2, all have them for free. And you can also download an interior preview of the game. If you'd like to see what the book looks like before you purchase it, um, there's a free preview where you can look at all the art and layout. And I will include a, a direct link to that in the description of the episode, both on YouTube and on the audio version, so people can just click and uh, find your way, uh, their way to, to your project. Awesome. Dave and Michelle? Um, I'll just say, you know, for the, the women out there, you know, we have strong female characters. You know, we don't have, you know, bikini-clad women with broadswords. I mean, they have real armor. Um, you know, they're, they're real characters, leaders and generals out there, so if you want something, you know, that, that appeals to, to women and you know, everybody else, you know, this, this game is very inclusive. Do you want to tell us more about that, if you wish? Are, are there a, a character or two you, you want to tell us about? Well, just, um, you know, one of our, our main characters is just, you know, we have um, one of the first ones we had drawn is, um, you know, a, a woman in, in armor. I, I don't think it's... Oh, yeah, she's on the back. Yeah, she's on the yeah. back. That, that's kind of like one of our main ones. Um, that we kind of started with, um, just because, you know, being male or female, it doesn't really matter. By the time you armored up, you know, you're yeah, and that's actually why we have, have skills. Whoever there, you you don't know who's in there. It you, could be you anybody. You don't know who. Um, anybody could be in there. So so it's you know it, it it doesn't matter. It's very inclusive, and you know a lot of games aren't 
aren't that way. And um, like the picture of the the Iridani general at the end, I think originally when we played it, it was a, a thought of as a male character. We hadn't ever had a female Iridani, and that art just came through. And um, the artist drew it as female. Perfect. Female, I was like, oh, that is just perfect. Um, absolutely love it. Love the character that way. Great, that's uh, the awesome. The famous battle lord in the, in the universe is a woman. The uh, uh, president of the alliance, the government, is a woman. Um, the most famous military veteran in the battle lord's universe is a woman. Um, half of our artists are women. The cover artist is a woman. Um, we, we really make sure that the game is inclusive and diverse, both in terms of the people making it and the people who are portrayed in it. Great. Dave, one last thing to add on that? Uh, I would say, uh, if, again, just kind of talking to how to reach out to us. We're on all different platforms. We respond pretty quickly on Discord, so that's a great place to connect with a group of people who are some familiar with the game, some not as familiar with the game, and ask the really hard questions. What if somebody does this, 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 this? Ooh, okay, well, let's break that down. <laughs> Here's what I would suggest, and, and there's the easy answer, the if you want to get crunchy so that people can kind of figure out what kind of gameplay they want to have. Um, and we encourage people to uh, try to find the ways to break the game. We tried to make it as, as, as robust as possible so people can try the wacky things and have an answer that they can get to that says, yeah, this is how we would handle that. So we, we try. Great. So it's a place to go when you have a changeling player flying its way on the back of another warrior and uh, trying to uh, steal their rifle uh, from their back. Perfect. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Go out to Discord and catch us. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me, the, the three of you. It was awesome. Uh, I hope you had a good time uh, with me uh, this afternoon. Uh, thanks, people watching this. Uh, please go check out uh, the products from uh, Battle Lords of the 21st Century. Again, all should be linked to uh, in the description of this episode. Please consider... Uh, signing up for the newsletter of the race podcast to find out everything we do please consider checking out virtually expo or the gauntlet rpg community event i should be running the life-saving magic of paris gondo uh no the, sorry uh, paris gondo the life-saving magic of inventorying uh it's cr it sounds crunchy but it's not that crunchy uh should be at virtually exposed so you can go check the events are virtually exposed to look for my game and hopefully battle lords of the 23rd century if not uh go check gen con thanks to the three of you and uh bye everyone thanks thanks for having us cheers, cheers.